so that that's actually interesting. Uh, so we didn't actually see. I didn't actually see this paper when we started it, but it was very interesting. That I found it later, and I thought it was very interesting that um, not only have we found that uh, the existing vector graphics APIs are suboptimal, it, the GPU vendors actually found this and found this a few years ago. Um, so it's kind of nice to actually be uh, doing what they wanted us to do all along. Um, and of course, it's written in Rust. That's why I'm giving the talk here. Um, and why would we do it in Rust? Well, because first of all, we need really low level performance. We're basically writing a game engine. Um, it's because that's how GPUs are optimized. That's what GPUs are optimized for. Um, but we're writing something that is, of course, very security sensitive. It's a web browser. It's going to be exposed to untrusted content, not directly, but you know, content can be structured in a way that they can basically send us any commands that they want. So we need to be free of memory safety problems. Um, but just as important, we need to be multi-threaded. Modern game engines are all multi-threaded. That's GPUs are increasingly being optimized for multi-threaded use, like uh, with APIs like Vulkan that are uh, on the way. So we need to be multi-threaded from the start. And Rust was a great thing to uh, was a great tool for us to do that because we didn't have to worry about data races and all that stuff. Um, Okay, so the uh, so as for what web, as now that I've motivated it, um, web render is as I said, it's a specialized renderer for CSS. It uses uh, it uses OpenGL, so it's directly to OpenGL. Um, it's not a general purpose vector graphics API. It's not a drop in replacement for Skia or for Core Graphics or for any of those other or Cairo, any of those other APIs that you might have used. Uh, it's just CSS. And uh, that's because, as I said before, if we tried to be a drop-in replacement for that, we would be limiting our performance. Um, basically, what we're doing is taking advantage of the fact that CSS has specific properties that are nice for the GPU. Um, retain mode multi-threaded graphics engine uh, takes a display list and draws it to the screen. So instead of, you know, if you've used APIs like Cairo, you may have seen things like, you know, you create a pen, you draw a path, and then you draw a... Uh, you know, and you change colors and you change clipping regions and so forth. This is not an API like that. This is actually an API where you give it a post laid out page. You give it positions of everything on the screen all at once, and it looks at the whole thing and optimizes it for uh, better GPU usage. And this is basically how we get our performance wins. Um, so to give you an example of what that is, concretely, here's a little bit of Wikipedia that I just uh, saved. So this is actually the display list that Sorvo generates, um, and you can see that it has uh, that it's basically a list of items. You have some, you know, some text, solid colors, images, shadows, um, and and their positions on the page and the order in which you draw them in, um, and not shown here, but also clipping regions for them. And they uh, and so you basically give all of this to uh, WebRender all at once. This is act. This is actually pretty much covers everything that WebRender can do. It has about six different items, but those six different items, actually everything in CSS can be described that way. Um, so uh, as for where we are, um, the so this work started about uh, five months ago, I guess, September 22nd. Um, two people, uh, Glenn, who's the in Australia, who's the uh, lead developer, and me. And so we have... Basic, at this point, we basically have implementations of all the CSS that Servo supports, and it actually landed today. Um, good day to be giving this talk. And there's lots of, uh, there's still a lot of bugs. Um, you know, in theory, we're all feature complete, but there are a lot of bugs that we're chasing. We're hopefully going to have it on, um, you know, in, in the next couple of months. Or on by default, so it's behind a switch right now. So uh, what you need to run it. We have OpenGL ES 2.1 and OpenGL 3. Uh, these are pretty, you know, these are pretty old. This pretty much covers everything that that you uh, that you have. This gives us um, these are similar to the minimum requirements that Android has, where it basically covers every mobile phone. Um, so, not everyone has OpenGL 3 features. Pretty much everyone on desktop does, but not everyone on mobile does. Um, but so we will use them, but we don't require them. Um, the uh, and one question we often get is, what if you don't have a GPU or your GPU drivers are busted? Um, we're not entirely sure, but there may be some way, to, or we may be able to use LLVM pipe or something to run it on the CPU, but we don't really have any plans yet there. That's still kind of, a, that's still kind of an open question. Um, 
So as for web render, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about is that uh, it's actually a separate library from Servo. So even if you're not a browser engine, if you can describe your graphics using CSS, uh, we will be able to render it for you. And um, I think this would be, for example, a really good backend for mobile apps or something like that. Um, if you have an OpenGL context and you have 2D vector graphics that, uh, that are like CSS that you want drawn, we can draw it and we can draw it very quickly. Um, hopefully as quickly as anything you would handwrite yourself in OpenGL. If uh, that's not the case, then you should maybe file a bug. Um, so how does it work? So uh, this is a little small, I'm sorry. But um, it's basically, we basically have two threads. We have a, um, and the so we have the backend thread, which has A, B, B, tree, tree building, resource building, node compilation, visible node collection, and frame publication. And then we uh, have a compositor thread, which actually does the GPU work, which has texture upload, resource rasterization, and drawing. And I'll go into these uh, in, in more detail. But the basic takeaway here is that there's two threads, one of which gets all of the work nest done on the CPU for the next frame, and, and then pushes everything to the GPU thread, which actually does all the GPU processing. So that actually gives us uh, a nice amount of parallelism and uh, is uh, basically is a, is a nice way to structure these things. Um, and in particular, it allows us to uh, continue drawing frames even if the CPU part is running slow. So the first part of this is uh, an AABP, AABB tree, which is short for Axis Align Bounding Box Tree. Uh, so the first thing we do is we take all, we take everything on the page, everything that you gave us, and we sort it into a bounding box tree. And the, basically the way this works is um, because things on the page are rec tend to be rectangles, is a really good structure. Um, you basically group things into rectangles and group those rectangles into larger rectangles. Um, and you create a tree structure, something like this. And uh, this is a very common technique. Essentially, you know, lots and lots of game engines, for example, do this. Uh, this and this ends up being a really good way uh, to organize your GPU commands uh, and do col and do calling and all the and things that I'll get into later. So. Yes, yes, it, it is a scene graph. So th this is where the display list becomes, uh, it basically be becomes a scene graph. Um, so uh, this is, so each of these nodes would contain the display items that I was talking about earlier. Um, so we start off with a flat list, which is what we get from, uh, from layout. And then we take these lists, these items and place, the first thing we do is we place them into the scene graph. Um, so, uh, so for resource building, uh, we traverse the tree and we find everything that we're gonna need. Um, so glyphs, images, paths, and shadows. And we do we rasterize all of those on the GPU right now, um, except for glyphs, which uh, we currently do on the CPU, but I'd love to do, do that on the GPU in the future. Um, we do everything, everything on the CPU, which is the glyphs, we rasterize in parallel. Um, and Rust made it very easy, made it very easy to do this. It was like um, it just went in one day, and it you know took uh, really it just took a few minutes to uh, do that. We're getting a lot of nice wins out of that, um, and these objects are retained from frame to frame. So we actually one thing to note that we actually handwrite all of our shaders. If you've looked at some of the other uh, some other GPU uh, engines, they often have shader combiners that will dynamically create shaders at runtime. We don't do any of that. We actually handwrite all of our shaders. And that's really nice for optimization. You know, if there's a problem, we can we don't have to write debug code that generates code. We can just debug code. Um, so th that's one of the wins we get by specializing to CSS. We only have a handful of shaders, like six or something. Um, so after that, we build batches for every node uh, in parallel. So this at, this step is actually the slowest step. Um, it actually takes a lot more time to act to generate. Usually, it takes more time to generate the commands then the, it takes the GPU to execute those commands, which is like, which really illustrates how fast GPUs are now, nowadays. Um, most things can actually be batched together. Uh, pretty much, in, it's not uncommon for us to render an entire page with complex shadows and stuff in one draw call. Um, and that's because we carefully uh, crafted a shader that basically, ha that basically handles everything. And it's actually a pretty simple shader. Um, 
So if we run out of texture space in an atlas or we have weird clipping regions that don't often arise on pages, then we may have to break patches. But usually um, we can submit everything to the GPU in one draw call. Um, and this is just basically going over, uh, we, we find the nodes that are visible and then we ship those over to the other thread. Um, and on the other thread, then we'll actually do the texture upload. We will do the rasterization command, so we'll switch shaders and uh, do things like draw box shadows, draw text shadows, draw border radii. We have special shaders for all of those. Um, and we group those as much as possible. So if you have 10,000 recs that all have shadows, we won't issue 10,000 draw calls to the GPU. We'll just do one. Um, and we group all resources into texture atlases, and we have the allocation code that manages that, those atlases. Um, so for drawing, uh, when we actually get to drawing, we batch them together. Uh, we try to use one shader as much as possible. Uh, for effects that were, some effects require intermediate surfaces, like opacity, we have to draw to a text, we have to draw to a texture and then blip that texture again for annoying reasons. Um, but we try to do the best we can to batch all this stuff together. Um, so, okay, so now for a couple of tricks that we do. Um, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because uh, we end up specializing this is where we kind of specialize the CSS and things that we find on the web. Uh, so one of our tricks is instance drawing, where uh, so we notice on pages the vast majority of things on a page are rectangles. In fact, it's very rare to find something that isn't a rectangle. Um, that it, CSS is defined in terms of boxes, so this is no accident. Um, but and this is not just the CSS specific thing. This is true for most UIs also. You know, most UIs consist of rectangles, axis line. Um, so uh, so this is actually wasteful if we use a full-blown graphics API, which is uh, you know, the normal OpenGL API is designed for drawing you know, meshes, 3D models, things like that, where they're not axis-aligned rectangles. So you end up submitting a whole bunch of vertices, um, which is kind of silly because you're just submitting rectangles. So we realized that we can actually do better with OpenGL 3, which with instance drawing, we can say we can Note that we can basically treat all the rectangles as the same four vertices uh, and submit them again and again and again. And uh, then we replace the, vert the vertex drawing with uh, data about each rectangle. Um, and this is, not, this is not anything new. Games have often uh, had the same observation for particle systems. So we're kind of doing the same things that GPUs are optimized for. Um, so this uh, dovetails nicely with the next trick which is um, we, so, so there are a few observations that really actually hurt GPU rendering of web pages um, in, uh, in basically in other engines. Uh, that's, and one thing that we noticed that was actually uh, often slowing other engines down is that, uh, including our engine before we switched to web render, um, which is that clipping is very expensive. And clipping if, is where, you know, if you have, uh, you know, an object and you want part of it, you want only render it within a certain box, a clip out the rest of the box. Um, there are ways to do this on the GPU with uh, scissors, stencil, you may have heard of these, um, but GPUs don't like to do a lot of those very quickly. They incur a lot of state changes, have a lot of overhead in the driver. Um, and we could do it on the CPU, and we actually did in earlier versions of web render, but that ends up being really slow. Um, in fact, when we did this, we found that the time we spent clipping was actually more than the time than all the rest of the time combined. Um, and it's just because GPUs are so much faster at this than CPUs are. Um, the second observation is that most clipping in CSS is really simple. It's just a box clipped to another box. For example, like consider an image that's partly scrolled off the page. That's the most common clip thing. Well, that's an extremely simple clip. Um, and the third observation is that it's so simple that actually clipping a rectangle to another rectangle always results in zero or one rectangles. Um, so, there is, so we modified this to actually take advantage of a trick where we pass the clip rectangle to the GPU and perform the clipping there in the vertex shader. And vertex shaders have the restriction that you can't create more vertices than you started with, which is why you normally can't do clipping there. But we never do because we have a, we're clipping a rectangle to a rectangle, which means that we have the same number of vertices, which means that we can do it in the vertex shader. So... Uh, so we actually, so 99 probably percent of, probably upwards of 95% of our clips are done on the GPU in the vertex shader in this way. And that was a huge performance win. Um, and 
we only have to uh, bail out to the CPU or the stencil buffer when we have weird clips, which don't happen very often. It's if you had like a div that had overflow hidden, another div inside that had a weird transform on it and overflowed that box, then we'd have to use the stencil buffer. But that pages don't usually do that. That's pretty rare. 